So I'm going to say up front, I think this is going to be one of my better reactionary reviews. See, the type of movie that I think lends itself best to doing a review of this is a movie that's kind of a mixed bag that has kind of a lot of interesting elements to it, but isn't really wholly bad or wholly good. Because if a movie's all good, then I, I just kind of praise it. There, there might be some elements to explain, but I just kind of... It's kind of hard to say anything too deep about. Like, you have, like, the Fast and the Furious movies, which I like. But aside from kind of talking about masculinity, patriarchy, and the alpha male, it's just not, like, it's just me saying I like the movie. Whereas if a movie's really, really bad, it's sometimes hard to explain why it's really bad. Because uh, you basically just have to watch it, and you can tell. But this film was fascinating. And... I, I've done a bit of thinking about it since I watched it last night and I've looked up kind of some, um, when I was watching it, I immediately made some comparisons to other works of fiction. I don't know if it was trying to reference them or it was just trying to tap into the same general idea as the other ones, but I'll talk about them as I go. Just a couple things off the top of my head it reminds me of is The Thing, it reminds me a lot of The Thing. Uh, obviously number 10 Cloverfield Lane and this is almost kind of a variant of that movie um it reminds me a bit of we were warned uh, no one probably gets that reference but obviously above everything else it reminds me of Mask of the Red Death if you don't know what Mask of the Red Death is just put it into YouTube you'll find someone reading it it's only 18 minutes long it's an Edgar Allan Poe story so I was reading a review about this, and I, I think it really kind of summarized my thoughts on it and what makes this such a fascinating film. As I've said in the past, I think the best part of postmodernity in terms of just art and media in general is the whole self-reflexive thing, uh, kind of deconstructing tropes, kind of playing with audience expectations, kind of going beyond just the basic story in trying to say, okay, this is how audiences react, these are the themes, but what is kind of the origin of this? What can this say about society and about the, the genre in general? And I think this movie really kind of summarizes that. Notice I haven't said if it's a good or bad movie yet, because I don't really know if you can even say this is a good or bad movie, because most of its flaws are kind of working as intended, as the expression goes. Meaning the flaws in this film, I think, are deliberately put there by the director to fulfill a certain purpose. And in some ways it makes them better, and in some ways it makes them more frustrating. Now, if you look at the reviews, critics love this movie, but audiences hate it. And that's not surprising. Audiences in general don't like art films, don't like experimental films. And I, I don't either, generally speaking, but this one was a lot better done than like 90% of art films I've seen. And it is an art film. It was advertised as kind of a generic horror movie, but it's not. It's a psychological thriller in an art film, kind of like The Road or something like that, which has some of the pretense of kind of being an action movie or a, a horror movie, but is in reality an art movie. It also kind of reminds me of... Another kind of example that comes to mind is Antichrist, which kind of bills itself a bit as a, as a horror movie, but is really an art film. But it's an art film that's actually kind of done well. And It Comes at Night is a good example of that. So kind of enough rambling about... Oh, sorry. Just to go back to it. So it, it is a film that I think by its nature and by its intent is meant to be extremely divisive. People, there are people who appreciate what the film's trying to do. The issues it's trying to raise, the stylistic decisions that were made. Because I think a lot of the film's flaws were put in there on purpose. Uh, as kind of to be self-reflexive or to say something about the genre. On the other hand, these flaws, despite being interesting to analyze, also make the movie a lot worse as, as a viewing experience. Uh, it makes the story have tons of plot holes. It has tons of things that are just not explored or explained. And it's just kind of not cathartic at all. 
it's kind of to a certain extent a fuck you to the audience and once again this is working as intended and i think this movie does this a lot better than like dozens or hundreds of movies that pretend to do this but just suck but once again i can see either point of view i can see people who overlook the film's flaws and say i i really appreciate the points it's trying to make and kind of that they tried to do something different and i can also understand the people who go it's just it makes the movie too shitty it, it undermines it as as a piece of cinema too much and like i said i understand both of these perspectives they're both completely legitimate and if people say they like the movie i agree if people say they think the movie's awful i agree so let's go into into the film now just as a general th rule on the um how should i put this delicately the nature of the family dynamic obviously i don't agree with that but i gotta judge the movie on its own merits because that's clearly not the focus of the movie it feels kind of more incidental than anything but so i just won't go into detail about it uh, people know my opinion on that kind of thing so it comes at night takes place in a indeterminate time it could be the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, the 2000s. It, like a lot of, I think, well-done horror movies, has this timeless kind of dreamlike feel that it takes place in um, an alternate reality or it just takes place in a generic timeline. That it kind of exists out of outside of time and kind of in a pocket world. It Follows is very similar to this. It Follows kind of takes place at an indeterminate time. You aren't really sure when it takes place because it kind of has elements from different eras, eras. And that's to kind of, once again, make it more surreal and dreamlike. Like, there aren't computers and cell phones in this movie, but there's other modern technology. And it clearly takes place in the modern day. But the film starts off with a, a family who's living together, a mother, father, a son, and a grandfather. And the grandfather has gotten some form of a plague. As he's dying, his um, son and grandson carry him out back, shoot him in the head after making peace with him, and burning his body. For a lot of the movie, the father and son are wearing gas masks, and it's pretty clear that there's some sort of plague going on. They live out in the middle of the wild in a boarded-up, fortified house, and they're heavily armed and always are taking fastidious cleaning procedures. So from this we can tell there is some sort of super virus or bacterial infection. Now, people say it's not really explained what it is. And some people have criticized the movie for that. I don't think that's really a flaw that they don't like. I don't think the infection really needs an explanation. We've seen enough movies like 28 Days Later, like Cabin Fever, where there's there just happens to be... <coughs> Um, there just happens to be a super virus. We get the concept. It's heavily implied they're living out in the middle of the country to escape the virus. It's heavily implied that it's destroyed civilization. And this is confirmed later as one of the characters says they've fled the cities and they've driven for days and not seen anything. So how much of civilization is left, we aren't really sure about. The family is content to... to sit out the collapse of civilization in their house and just try to survive it. And that's kind of the first case where we find the whole Mask of the Red Death thing. In the story Mask of the Red Death, a plague called the Red Death is ravaging the countryside. And the nobility led by Prince Prospero seal themselves within a fortified abbey and just kind of enjoy themselves waiting for the plague to subside. Um, and just kind of enjoying themselves. The actual nature of the Red Death is ambiguous up until the end. And, and I'll talk about that in a minute. But it, in essence, we aren't really sure if the Red Death, is, as presented in the story, is metaphorical, allegorical, if it's just a disease, if it actually is supernatural. It's, it's not really important. But the idea of withdrawing from society and trying to survive completely isolated really reminded me of that. So 
we kind of see the family go about their daily chores just trying to survive and in the middle of the night a man tries to break into their home named will so the man who tries to break in they basically beat up and tie to a tree and they are questioning him as to whether he why he's there why he tried to break in what's going on and if he has the illness so he tells them that he has a family living in an abandoned house a couple miles from there and he has some food which he wishes to trade for water so that's kind of interesting and we aren't really sure if he's telling the truth or not his whole story is very vague we, we don't really know and that's kind of a feature we have throughout this movie uh, they deliberately leave plot holes or just things unexplained for instance the whole it comes at night is never explained it's it's from the trailer from the title and from some scenes in the movie it's implied there's some sort of supernatural presence living in the woods but we never receive confirmation one way or another uh, there's there's a lot of unexplained supernatural elements in this movie so we don't know if this is entirely a result of paranoia and psychological stress or if this is like some sort of purgatory or just what's going on in general. So after a day, they find out that Will is does not have the virus. So Paul decides to, um, at the urging of his wife, go out and take his, his truck, find the man's family and bring them back. Because if they have more people with firearms, they can defend the house better. And they have some chickens and goats, and chickens and goats produce reliable protein on a daily basis. Um, obviously milk and chickens, and if they're opposite gender goats, then they can breed more goats. So as they head out, he barely goes a mile or two when someone shoots at his car. So his car gets shot at, and he manages to kill one of them, the people who shoots at his car, and... Will jumps out of the car and starts beating the crap out of the other one. As Paul goes over to shoot the other one, Will tells him to stop, but Paul shoots the guy anyways. And so the question that's immediately asked is, did Will leave him, lead him into a trap? Because Will said he, there was nobody nearby. Uh, he had gone for miles, uh, for days, and not seen anything. And you have these two guys who immediately know where he is, who get the drop on him, and Will told them not to kill one. So we don't know what, what the hell's happening. And this is another thing that's never explained. How many survivors are there? Is there another gang? Were those guys part of another group? Did Will know them? We have no idea. But later, um, just slightly later in the movie, uh, Paul, who's the, the father, comes back with will and the family and they take up residence in the house now the son throughout the movie has these unexplained visions uh he has visions of getting the disease he has visions of something strange in the woods wandering the house at night a lot of the movie is it's very ambiguous who who's ill who's not ill what's a dream and what isn't a dream there's even a part where he dreams that he's in a dream and he wakes up and then it's implied that it was a, a fever dream and that he was infected and then he wakes up again. So what's reality? What's not? Why is he getting these dreams that seem almost prophetic and supernatural? It's a plot element that's never explained. It could just it could be something supernatural. It could be the early stages of the disease. It, it could be. Uh, just the stress of living out in complete isolation. We don't know, and the film makes no pretense of telling us. And that's something we're going to hear a lot as we go through the plot of this movie. The film deliberately has all these plot strands that aren't explored and don't go anywhere. And in part, this is, I think, kind of to lampshade how in other movies, the characters just kind of inexplicably figure things out. Things kind of work out. It heads towards a conclusive ending that answers your questions or at least references them again and states that there are no answers in this film there aren't answers there's just a lot of questions and i think that's done on purpose to say in life there are just things that happen that no one understands this kind of reminds me in we were warned where there there was parts of we were warned which was a kind of a remake of war of the worlds where you had kind of this cnn-esque organization 
talking about um an alien an ambiguous alien assault on earth where these meteorites kept falling from the sky and the government desperately tried to deal with them but a lot of elements were like the rapture seemed to happen at one point in the movie and it was never referenced again or explained the title we were warned doesn't make any sense it's never really addressed what was the warning and at the end they say the fault is not in the stars but with ourselves so did something happen did they provoke the aliens we don't know in the mo in the uh, tv special never tells us and that's left deliberate to kind of be the the statement that in life very often when a disaster happens there's a lot of confusion so the family's living with them and the the main the 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 son begins to have sexual fantasies about the wife of of Will and she seems to be flirting with him now it, it, does this contribute to anything is she actually flirting with him or is it his imagination once again we're never told and the plot strand doesn't really go anywhere it's just kind of something introduced and then abandoned and we're left wondering if it played a role in the events of the movie, if it was just kind of another false end, etc. So the son continues to have visions, which once again, we don't know if they're real or not. But as kind of the movie drags along, we have a scene where Paul and Will are talking and they share a drink and Will gives a different version of his initial story, which makes Paul wonder if he was lying the whole time. He realizes he doesn't know anything about the man and nothing he says really is consistent. Once again, as I said before, I hate to be a broken record, this plot strand doesn't go anywhere. We never learn who Will really is or, or anything about his past or if he was lying or telling the truth. Were those two men helping him out? Did he intend to betray Paul? We don't know enough to say. So then the movie kind of comes to its pivot point where they're chopping wood and their dog Stanley runs off into the woods in search of something. As they run off into the woods, the son runs after the dog and comes to a clearing. He completely freaks out when he reaches this clearing and it seems like he saw or heard something. It's very quickly done and the audience has no attempt to take it in. But he is obviously utterly scared by it. And it's never explained what the dog ran after. Once again, could it be the it that comes at night? Is it some supernatural presence? Is it another group of survivors? We don't know. And once again, the movie doesn't provide us an answer to this. However, the next night, the son gets up and he finds the Andrew, the kid of, the, uh, of Will and his wife, <clears throat> lying on the floor in front of a bed. He goes and and brings the little boy by the takes the little boy by the hand and brings him back to his mother and father and then hears a noise and goes downstairs he finds that the front door is wide open and stanley the dog is lying there uh basically cut up and infected at least the father thinks he's infected there aren't that many diseases that I know of that can jump from human to animal. I think rabies is one of the few ones, but in my experience, just from what I've read over time, it's very unusual for disease to be able to jump from animal to animal because the biology is completely different. But they shoot Stanley, drag him out and burn his body as well. Trevor has a fit as, uh, sorry, Trevor the son has a fit as the dog is really his only companion, and he loves that dog. His father insists, though, that the animal is sick, although, once again, was Stanley sick? Was he not sick? What's, what's going on? Uh, the question of who opened the door is never answered. Did Andrew sleepwalk and open the door? Did Trevor sleepwalk and open the door? I think it was said earlier in the movie that only Paul had keys to the front door. So once again, we, we don't know. But Will says we should each couple should stay in their rooms for the next 24 to 48 hours to see if either group is infected. Trevor spies on the Will and his family and they hear Andrew crying throughout the day. This seems to imply that Andrew has been infected. Now, whether he was infected because he opened the door 
and got it from Stanley or uh, Trevor gave it to him because Trevor opened the door. We have no idea. It's never explained. But Will and his wife go and confront... Sorry, um, Paul and his wife go and confront Will and Will has a gun and states that he wants to leave. They claim, of course, that their child isn't infected, but at the same time, they demand that he keep his eyes closed. The two signs of the plague, uh, the three signs of the plague are your eyes turn black, you start vomiting blood, and your body becomes covered with uh, welts. <clears throat> so, there's a tense scene, and basically Will and his family decide to leave, but it kind of turns into a snafu with Will beating the crap out of Paul, and Paul and his wife shoot the entire family, including the son. Paul seems to have a breakdown, as does Trevor, as they just killed three people. Now, the rest, the last five to ten minutes of the movie, people seem to have really thought that it was clear what happened. I was really just befuffled because... As the movie goes on, Trevor is becoming less and less mentally stable. So Trevor looks at himself in the mirror and it looks like his eyes are turning black and he seems to vomit. I don't recall him actually vomiting blood. I thought he was just vomiting out of disgust that they shot the people. But he wakes up later and his mother has the black eyes indicating that she has the illness. Although once again, I don't know if this is a dream or not. This cuts to the final scene in the movie where Will and his, sorry, Paul and his wife are sitting at the table and silently, and I think one of them says, no, says something about Trevor, and then the film just suddenly stops. Now, people say the implication is they're both infected. I didn't really see signs of it. It might just be that the scene was really quick and I, I missed it. But once again, was this whole movie a flashback? Was it a dream? Was was this reminiscing? We don't know. Was the last part of the movie where the, the family was infected a delusion of Trevor? We have no idea. There's so many elements in this film that are just kind of completely unexplained. And once again, I think this is by intention. And there's no catharsis at the movie. None of them are answered. And I think it's supposed to kind of be an anti-movie to kind of play with audience expectations and to kind of, like I said, lampshade the audience's expectations. The end of the movie kind of reminds me of the end of The Thing where, what's his name, the, the two people are standing in the snow and they acknowledge the absurdity and the pointlessness of their mutual distrust. It's just kind of this nihilistic ending where nothing really gets resolved. And they both kind of, the characters kind of realize that nothing was achieved despite all their struggles. Like I said, it's also very similar to Mask of the Red Death in that you have these people who withdrew from society in an attempt to survive. And they went to all these lengths to survive, but in the end, death came for them regardless. So is this film metaphorical? For it, people trying to escape death in general and that death always comes in the end regardless of how far you try to hide it is the point of this movie supposed to be that people when they're when they're desperate and they're driven to survival they start to break down and they lose their basic humanity it's um it's it's like i said it's very difficult to make any of these determinations and, and at some level, I can see critics liking this and people who really like horror movies, even if they think the movie has flaws, still liking it. But I can kind of see that the common viewer just going, this fails as a story. And it does fail as a story. Um, the cinematography in the movie is absolutely amazing. It's very tense. It's one of the best shot movies I've seen in years. It's, um, it, it is very impressive as a, as a film. And that kind of further makes the whole thing more interesting. Because at a certain level, overall this is an extremely meta movie. And I find it impossible to really give a review of in terms of out of 10 or if how much I enjoyed it, etc. 
I would recommend watching it. Just go into it understanding it's not supposed to be an audience-friendly film, nor is it supposed to be satisfying, offering answers, or really a conclusion. It's one of those films that just kind of stops. So I hope you enjoyed the review. I think it's one of my best ones, at least in a while. And more reviews to come.